won the role of evolution. Whatever is done from love always occurs beyond good and evil. Beyond good and evil, Friedrich Nietzsche. Darwin proposed that evolution proceeded by both natural selection and sexual selection. The tenets of natural selection have been exhaustively studied for more than a century, and we assume the reader has at least a passing acquaintance with this subject. In contrast, the formal study of evolution driven by sexual selection, especially in humans, has been virtually ignored, possibly due to social prudery with respect to the subject of sex. Sex is a messy business, after all. The result of such research could be personally unsettling and socially risky. Nevertheless, the problem of sex remains. Why sex evolved is especially problematic. Point one It turns out that attempting to explain mating behavior simply by means of survival is too naive, resulting in theories showing that asexual reproduction is more advantageous. Clearly, such theories are in error. Thus Darwin's distinction between natural selection and sexual selection must be reconsidered. Our interest in the why of sex results from curiosity, whether or not our experience and observation of the courtship and mating behavior of a wide variety of women support the tenets of evolutionary psychology in general, and sexual selection in particular. Furthermore, we see no hard distinction between the biological and the psychological aspects of the human being, but we consider them both as expressions of a whole. If you, the reader, are mystified in the matter of female relationships, some of the material we present in this book may seem to you to be very far from reality. However, when you observe the principles in action, you will begin to understand that female behavior and female psychology are both perfectly understandable. This chapter will help you to understand some of the foundational psychological principles upon which male-female relationships are played out on a more biological and behavioral level in real life. These principles help explain a wide range of female behavior we discuss through the book. We'll start with sexual selection, then discuss evolutionary psychology, and close with some important points about altruism and selfishness as defined from an evolutionary perspective. One the how of sex, that swapping of genetic material, is well understood. Sexual selection. Selection refers to heritable traits that remain in, and have spread through, a population, because those traits serve to increase the rate of reproduction of the organisms embodying those traits. Heritability refers to genetically determined traits, which vary in their expression within a population. For example, we will refer to the female's manipulative skills, her degree of sexual desire, her mate-selecting skills, and so on. Variation refers to a state in which there exists a variety of genetically determined traits within a population. Sexual selection can be divided into two main categories, intersexual selection, representing choices made with the opposite sex, and intrasexual selection, representing choices made with respect to competition with the same sex. Intersexual selection refers to the traits that one sex generally prefers in the opposite sex, such as leadership qualities, big muscles, impudence, aggressive behavior, and so on. See Chapter 19, Male Qualities Attractive to Women, for some practical tips on how to cultivate some of these key attributes within yourself. For example, a woman of a lower social level can easily identify survival with the skills for physical work at home, and she therefore may prefer a man who possesses good skills for physical labor. A woman of a higher social level, on the other hand, may identify survival more with leadership qualities and impudence, and therefore may prefer a man who is able to put himself in the position of being the leader of other men. Intrasexual selection refers to competition occurring among the members of the same sex for mating access to the opposite sex. For example, it has been observed that a woman's sexual arousal can increase when she becomes aware that she is in the presence of a man who is sexually attractive to women in general. In other words, Men who are successful with women tend to naturally attract more women to them merely as a result of their being attractive to other women. What is happening in this case is that the female evolutionary system has detected the man as being fitter for survival, and the female consequently reacts with increased sexual desire. Evolutionary Psychology 
Evolutionary psychology proposes that the human brain comprises many functional mechanisms called psychological adaptations, or evolved cognitive mechanisms, all evolving from natural or sexual selection. Some examples include language acquisition modules, incest avoidance mechanisms, cheater detection mechanisms, intelligence and sex-specific mating preferences, foraging mechanisms, alliance tracking mechanisms, agent detection mechanisms, and so on. We won't get into too much detail about each of those mechanisms, and we'll limit our discussion to female sexuality and female emotional life, and female reproductive mechanisms from the point of view of sexual selection. In general, evolutionary psychology asserts that many universal behaviors and aspects of society result from evolutionary adaptations. Such behaviors are studied to determine whether they are preserved in evolution as being useful to survival, or deleted for not being useful. For example, when we refer to females with high sexual drive or to females with low sexual drive, we are referring to subgroups of women whose baseline sexual drive has evolved differently depending on different survival needs and behaviors. Within the framework of evolutionary psychology, a woman with a high sex drive is more prone to get impregnated by different men, which shifts her focus from the care of one child to the care of many children. Depending on her behavior with respect to social norms, such a woman may be labeled promiscuous, or worse, slutty. A woman with a low sex drive is less prone to be impregnated by many different men. Her focus is more on the care of fewer children than on her being impregnated by many men. Again, depending on her behavior, such a woman may be labeled, cold, or, frigid. Both high sex drive and low sex drive females are useful to nature for different reasons. In the first case, wider genetic variety results. In the second case, greater genetic survivability results. Interestingly, these natural differences have been distorted by men, in an attempt to understand them and to cope with the fear caused by them. We believe that male cognitive distortion of these natural feminine traits is the reason for such beliefs within our modern population as the madonna slash -whore complex which we discuss extensively later in the book, along with many other examples such as the so-called last-minute resistance and anti-slut defense. Altruism and Selfishness Many men, especially men who have become emasculated by women, fail to understand the real evolutionary meaning of female altruism and or selfishness, which truly depends on the circumstances. They fail to see it as a continuously changing process that occurs within the same woman, and instead they tend view it in a more static and conflictual way. We believe that under the influence of the madonna slash whore complex, men stereotypically categorize women into rigid categories of altruistic or selfish. This is understandable, because some of the mechanisms which are useful to the continuation of life and the fitness of the species are often very immoral and shocking when seen from the point of view of the individual. But this is the way it is. Usually, women are naturally altruistic towards their children, and to a lesser extent, close family members. But what about a woman's interactions with men that she has romantic or sexual relationships with? Should you be expecting mercy or altruism towards you from your female romantic partners? Perhaps, perhaps not. Our belief is that it's never appropriate for a man to expect altruism from a woman, only to appreciate a woman's altruism when she provides it. Men who become physically unfit in relationships learn very quickly that many women have no compunction against kicking a man while he is down. As David says, she needs to feel that he is the same strong bastard she was initially attracted to, even when he is sick in bed with the flu. This is a purely selfish response from the woman for evaluating, on an emotional level, the man's continued fitness. Consider the predicament suffered by the physically large, menacing Icelandic berserker Egil Skallagrimson. The onset of ill health, probably Paget's disease too, gradually rendered him deaf, blind and subject to migraines, whence, as the saga tells us, he was ridiculed by the women of his household, the same women he protected and provided for in his younger, healthier days. 3. Egil, after moving in with his son-in-law, Grimm, at Mosfell, was walking outside one day when he stumbled and fell. 
Some of the women who saw this laughed. You're really finished, now, Egil, they said, when you fall, without being pushed. The women didn't laugh so much when we were younger, said Grimm. It's to Egil's credit he eventually expired of old age, rather than the treachery or mischief rampant in Iceland during the periods of the sagas. Among humans, altruism can be observed when comparing a woman from a more traditional, patriarchal country, to a woman from a more politically correct, industrialized country. A woman of a traditional patriarchal country will be more motivated in terms of altruistic behavior towards her husband, that is, the family's provider, because the role of family and patriarchy is still seen as much more important in those countries. In fact, supporting her man by sacrificing herself will increase the likelihood of spreading her own genes to her children. This altruistic effect is virtually lost in politically correct Western countries, such that a woman's motivation for altruistic behavior towards her husband, provider, may be almost non-existent, or will be limited to a short period of time between getting pregnant to the early years of the infant's upbringing. Selfishness emerges when the woman can induce a man to pay for the children without impinging on her freedom, via the state-sanctioned mechanism of child support. This selfishness provides the woman with material support for children by one man, while allowing her to become impregnated by another man, with little or no material or social risk to herself. In short, evolutionarily derived altruism and selfishness both have clear reproductive advantages, depending on the woman's material and social circumstances. A practical man will keep these notions in mind and arranging his affairs with the woman or women in his life. 2 http forward slash forward slash www.viking.ukla.edu slash scientific underscore american slash eggles underscore bones dot htm 3 the sagas of icelanders practical advice it's not mandatory to accept all of the tenets of evolutionary psychology in order to be successful with women However, such a study will broaden your understanding of why females think and act the way that they do. Three books we have found very helpful are Matt Ridley's The Red Queen, Robin Baker's Sperm Wars and Jeffrey Miller's The Mating Mind. Each of these books are written by an expert in their field, brief reviews of each follow, below. One of the defining books on the evolution of sexuality is The Red Queen by Ridley, 1. The author puts forth several theories as to why men feel compelled to ask a woman's hand in marriage and how we get our concepts of physical beauty, among many others. Ridley also presents a convincing array of statistics which seem to prove that a woman is more likely to be impregnated during an illicit affair than she is with her husband or long-term boyfriend. The Red Queen is fun read, and Ridley wrote it in an easily accessible style that anyone new to the field of evolutionary psychology can readily grasp and enjoy. We therefore highly recommend The Red Queen to help round out your education. Baker's Sperm Wars, too, is another extremely interesting book examining human reproductive strategy. Baker makes a case based on evolutionary biology that human males and females exhibit a wide range of sexual behavior as an evolutionary response for widening the gene pool. His treatment is explicit, at times graphic, in its description of mating strategies, and he pulls no punches with respect to controversial topics or even criminal behavior on the part of either males or females. As troubling as many of the behaviors Baker documents are, we find that fitting such behaviors into a rational and naturally evolved framework is extremely helpful for guiding our interactions with women and men. Miller, an evolutionary psychologist at the London School of Economics and at UCLA, proposes in The Mating Mind, 3, that a large portion of the human brain evolved into a courtship mind, the mating mind. This explains why many genetic traits such as talents for music, or mathematics, or mechanics, which have very poor value from the point of view of natural selection, have evolved in our species. Miller maintains that both sexes have evolved many significant ways of displaying fitness via expression of creative intelligence, such as storytelling, poetry, art, music, sport, dance, humor, kindness and leadership. That such traits not strictly connected with survival is problematic in other theories. As we wrote in the introduction, this book is not intended to be a scientific textbook. Our main goals are to entertain and inform, 
and hopefully inspire men to action in creating the relationships that they desire with women. The interpretations given to the scientific literature cited are purely subjective and constitute the author's own experiences with a wide variety of women and their interpretations of the studies. The validity of our interpretations should be confirmed or negated by concretely testing them in the field of male-female relationships. Our experience, however, is our own. We're positive that if men test our theories within the realm of everyday experience with women, they will find them to be extremely practical. We encourage you to maintain an open mind, to read the books reviewed above, and to read more on this topic from the variety of sources found in the bibliography. Club Suit Joseph Diamond Suit David Hart Suit Franco Spade Suit 2. Female Neuropsychology Perhaps truth is a woman who has reasons for not letting us see her reasons? The Gay Science, Friedrich Nietzsche Neuropsychology is the study of how the function and structure of the brain relates to specific psychological processes. Part of neuropsychology involves studying how brain activity expresses itself through verbal, cognitive and physical indicators. For example, with regards to sexuality and emotional life, there have been recent studies on the effects of childhood abuse on the neuropsychological and cognitive functions in women, and the effects of hormonal activity on sexual orientation. Point one. For centuries, women have been more advanced in knowledge of male sexual neuropsychology, women needed such skills for physical survival in a world dominated by large, aggressive men. Women are usually totally silent about their deep knowledge of the male psyche and sexuality. We believe this silence is a result of 1. The female need to manipulate the male into a provider role for reasons of survival. 2. The female need for social acceptance, or social status preservation when promiscuity is punished, this refers to the madonna slash her complex, which is extensively discussed later in the book. Our particular interest in neuropsychology is on signs of female sexual arousal which can be detected by having a normal conversation with a woman, without the need to physically escalate the interaction towards a sexual act. Point two, sexual escalation is defined as the sequence of acts which bring a couple closer to the act of lovemaking. Understanding how to detect the level of female arousal without escalating physically increases a man's social awareness, allowing the interaction to proceed covertly rather than overtly. Since there exists a complex of verbal and nonverbal signs which indicate that the female is becoming sexually aroused, this is a skill, a woman's arousal is expressed through her body and her brain's cognitive activity in ways that can be detected by simple observation. This concept of detecting female arousal through observation has been taboo for many centuries, we believe partly due to the Madonna slash or complex and partly because we are only now beginning to understand the connection between brain activity and verbal and nonverbal signals. Due to the effect on the scientific media of the Madonna slash or complex, a search of scientific literature on the topic of female sexual arousal finds studies about the abnormalities of female sexuality. There are very few articles on how a woman's sexual arousal can be detected in the context of normal, everyday social interactions. One we would like to see the subject of female neuropsychology taught to men at school. Many marriages would be saved and many couples would be happier. Two, since this is not a book about sexology, we will not be discussing subjects such as the female orgasm or difficulties with orgasm, language and female sexual arousal. Normal, healthy, adult women often become sexually aroused by words and communication. In neuropsychological terms, sexual arousal in women goes like this, words and communication and their effect on the woman's inner mental process creates a fantasy for her, and from this primary process follows the biological signs of sexual arousal, such as vaginal lubrication. Words and communication and their effect on the woman's inner mental process create pleasurable emotions, and from this primary process follows the biological signs of sexual arousal, for example an increase in her libido. The emotions which cause sexual pleasure within a woman can be both positive, as in joy, or negative, as in fear or anger. We postulate that a woman who is routinely sexually aroused by negative emotions is almost definitely a woman with psychological problems and a woman with lower self-esteem, LSE, explained in depth later in the book. 
We also postulate that to a certain extent all women are sexually aroused by strong emotions, and that strong emotions can also include those that we would consider as negative emotions, even within a psychologically healthy woman. Female Need for Communication Though females may train themselves to act like men, in reality they have a very deep biological urge to be talkative. Certain studies indicate that females get a rush of pleasure by certain hormones when talking. Female hormones seem to act in such a way so as to induce in the female an extreme need for emotional expression and talking with her peers. It seems likely that men and women have difficulties in communication because the language they use and the needs they have with regards to their communication are often very different. Science has not been able to demonstrate this for sure, but several studies seem to indicate that what is intended as communication may be something totally different for men and for women. It is possible that already at the age of 18 weeks, pregnancy hormones define a totally different structure of the brain in regards to what is intended as communication. In other words, sexual hormones may affect the parts of the male and female brain dedicated to communication, such that their neuropsychological expression may be totally different depending on whether the person is a male or female. Mutual Gazing there is a need for the female of our species to seek mutual gazing or deep and prolonged eye contact. In our extensive field experience we have repeatedly noticed this to be true. When a female is deprived of mutual gazing, she gets anxious and depressed. Conversely, when she is rewarded by mutual gazing she gets pleasure and is satisfied. You might have noticed that your wife or girlfriend will become increasingly agitated when your eyes are focused intently for any length of time on a television sporting event or towards your computer screen. Our field experience also indicates that females have ambivalent feelings in regard to males who reward them by talking a lot and engaging in mutual gazing. On one hand, they feel happy and rewarded. On the other hand, in the long run, Women will react with a decrease in sexual attraction towards the male who seeks too much attention from women in this way. Our rationale for this is that sexual attraction is created by contrast. Ultimately, females are attracted by masculine features. Therefore, men who reward females with a lot of feminine traits such as conversation and mutual gazing are at risk of having those females lose attraction for them in the long run. These men risk becoming too effeminate in the eyes of their women. Calibration is therefore crucial, you will need to listen and observe and thereby determine the right amount of these things. Female Blueprint A female blueprint is a specific set of emotions which is individual to the particular woman and which elicits sexual arousal in her when it is targeted, either consciously or unconsciously, by the male. The blueprint has an evolutionary purpose. It sets the conditions for specific evolutionary selection based on certain specific features, which are by nature much more specific than what would arouse most males. Males, as we all know, can be easily aroused by the sight of a naked, beautiful woman. But female arousal is not usually as simple as that. Here are some typical female blueprints. A woman is sexually aroused by successful businessmen who cause her to daydream about flying worldwide for the purpose of building successful businesses. As you can see, this is very specific, and the woman will predictably become sexually aroused by men who elicit this blueprint from her. She may be totally incapable of sexual arousal with a guy who is of the rock star type and without good business sense. A woman is sexually aroused by men who give her the feeling of being free and wild for example, in the manner that a rock star or a member of a motorcycle gang might do. In this case, she will remain completely cold sexually and in the company of a businessman and will show biological signs of sexual arousal when in the presence of the rock star. A woman is sexually aroused by the emotions created by going shopping and looking for red underwear for herself, especially if this happens in the company of a man who is able to describe with words the features of these clothes. We'll have more to say about such language, which we call rich description. As you can see, female sexual arousal has much wider variability when compared with male sexuality. Passivity and receptiveness Passivity and receptiveness are essential states that the average woman needs to get into in order to become aroused sexually. 
a truly feminine woman will find it difficult to become sexually aroused with a man unless he is able to make her comfortable with being both passive and receptive to the man and his advances. If a woman indicates that she becomes aroused by acting tough, by fighting, or by primarily visual means, similar to a man, we can say that her masculine behavior has either been learned or is intrinsic to her nature for biological reasons. Body Language and Sexual Arousal It would be almost impossible to list and describe all of the potential signs of female sexual arousal. We provide a few key examples in order to give you an overview of the correlation between the psychology of a woman and the neuropsychological expression of her arousal. Soft signs are expressions visible through body language and through cognitive brain activity that something is happening within the brain. What follows is a list of some soft signs indicating female sexual arousal. This list could be very lengthy, especially for an experienced seducer. 1. Looking downward after having had eye contact with a male she is sexually attracted to is a clear sign of submission among all primates. 2. Giggling is often sign of submissiveness. 3. Emotional or dramatic outbursts. In most cases, this is a clear sign of sexual arousal in a woman. 4. Impaired concentration and an increase in the unrelatedness of emotions within a sequence. 5. An increase in lower body movements which attract male attention. 6. Blushing. 7. Scratching of her wrists and inner arms. Practical advice. All of our work in this book is based on the assumption that the human being is a cybernetic system wherein the mind and body are inseparable parts of the same system and affect each other. In other words, we believe that the mind and the body of a person are closely coupled, rendering true distinctions difficult to determine. You are now in a position to train yourself to observe the soft signs of arousal within your woman. You will find a clear correlation with what you do, and what you do not do in the course of your relationship and the signs of her arousal. Learn to calibrate. Keep in mind that the main purpose of evolution is to screen for better genes and that everything that your woman does or doesn't do is in one way or another linked to that purpose. There are a couple of very good guidebooks with respect to soft signs available in the mainstream literature. Leo Lowndes' Undercover Sex Signals, for, is a compendium of just such mannerisms as listed above, and many, many more. Ms. Lowndes is an outstanding author, perceptively noting that such signals should not be taken at face value. Rather, view each soft sign as a letter. By learning to assemble these letters, you become adept at reading her words, which in turn are communicating her intentions. Tracy Cox's Super Flirt, 5, could be considered an illustrated encyclopedia of body language. Some of the material is similar in content to undercover sex signals, but the presentation is complementary. We recommend that you get both books. Club Suit Joseph Diamond Suit David Hart Suit Franco Spade Suit 3. Female Logic Explained I want wonderful and fascinating and marvelous things to happen to me. And I don't want to do anything to make them happen. Nothing at all. Lanya, from Dahlgren, by Samuel R. Delaney. For ages, men have considered female logic, or the female way of thinking, to be one of the greatest mysteries in the universe. Psychoanalysts, philosophers and poets have spent countless amounts of time agonizing over this topic. Well, the good news is that female logic, also known as chick logic, can be explained to men in a perfectly understandable way. You can learn how female logic works just like you can learn the functions of a computer or the technical specifications of a car. First of all, based on what we considered in Chapter 1 with regards to evolutionary psychology, let's stipulate that every function of the human brain has an evolutionary purpose. The evolutionary purpose of female logic is to achieve two basic goals. 1. To create ideal conditions for the procreation and birth of children, and ideal conditions to protect those children during their early years of development. 2. To influence the men and the environment around her to give her and her children support and protection. This influence commonly manifests as manipulation, more about manipulation in Chapter 13, which in this scenario may be seen as a positive force used by the woman instinctually as a means to support life.
A woman naturally achieves these goals by creating within herself a sense of emotional congruence. When creating such emotions, the woman is especially concerned with how she feels right now, as opposed to a male logic concern of how a correlates to be, or how a is the cause of be. In psychologically healthy women, these will be emotions of pleasure and safety. In other women, drama, histrionics, and hysteria. So